Well, good morning and welcome to church. For those of us who are physically in the room and joining us online, welcome to uh, the Christmas season. Can y'all believe it? It is the Christmas season and we are thrilled that you're here this weekend, no pun intended. But before we dive in uh, to our, our sermon here, I want to I wanna just encourage you over the course of these weeks, over the course of the Christmas season, uh, to invite somebody to church. We Studies show, the church gurus who are out there, studies show that, that people are more likely to accept an invitation to church during uh, the Christmas season. So uh, I want to uh, just, just in, challenge you and encourage you to uh, invite someone um, to church and be a part of what God is doing here at Connection. If they don't have a church home, we'd love to just have them here uh, with us over these uh, few weeks that we're going to celebrate Christmas together. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to get there in just a second. And uh, I, I love Christmas uh, for a variety of reasons. And then there's some things about Christmas I, I don't necessarily uh, love. Um, uh, one thing that may shock some, some people that I don't love, I don't love Christmas music. Uh, yeah, like, it's like, whoa, what do you mean? How do you love Christmas and don't love Christmas? It's just not my cup of tea. Like, I'd rather, I'd rather put on some good worship music, uh, you know, and, and go after that. Um, and like when the radio stations change over to Christmas music, I change the radio station. See, see, we got people leaving now that I don't love Christmas music. Uh, see the scrutiny I get? No, but, but, um, I don't, I, and one thing I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't love the anticipation in the lead up to Christmas. Um, like one of the things I don't love about that is decorating. Um, I love decor. See, she's really leaving now, but I don't love decorating. Okay. One of the reasons I don't love decorating is because I've got to go up in my attic cause that's where we keep all our Christmas stuff. And, and inevitably you pull the attic stairs down and you're lucky, like you, you, you're hoping that the attic stairs don't hit you in the face, like Clark Griswold. And, uh, and, and so, but, but inevitably you get all this, this, the get it out and what, what's on top of that? Like 11 months worth of dust. And so like, it, like you get that and all of a sudden, like 10 minutes after I get everything done, I'm like, oh, God. And, and, and look, in 2020, when you sneeze around somebody, like, like, oh, Bro, you better put on face mask. Like, 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 and so, and, and so, you can't. Like, you're kind of, you're kind of nervous about all that stuff. But I do love Christmas decorations. Like, I love when someone else puts them up, and and when they're already up, and you get to see that glow of the light, like early in the morning or late at night. And, and so, like, it's really, really, really cool, and, and it's beautiful to look at. And um, and, and so, I love uh, some of the trappings and the traditions of Christmas. And um, but if we're not careful, if we're not careful. Over time, those trappings and those traditions of Christmas will take over the real meaning of Christmas and why we truly, truly, as followers of Jesus, want to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're starting our Christmas series today. It's called The Thrill of Hope. And you'll probably recognize that from uh, one of, I, I do have some Christmas songs that I like, and one of them is O Holy Night. And in that, in that um, song, there's a line that says, the thrill of hope, the, re the weary world rejoice. That's hard to say if you're not singing it. Um, and so I think, just my opinion, I think we're not, there's not a better line for 2020 than that line. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. And I don't know, I, I, I think that word hope really kind of just, just signifies and, and solidifies what we get to celebrate at Christmas. You know, we could say it's about love. We could say it's about peace. We could say it's about joy, but the Christmas season truly is about hope. In, in a verse in Acts 2, 26, it says, he says, it says that we're going to let our bodies rest in hope. I love that. Let our bodies rest in hope. Eugene Peterson in the message uh, translation, message, message paraphrase says it, says that we're going to pitch our tents in the land of hope. I love that. I love that. We can just pit, pitch our tents in the land of hope. Because here's the thing. Here's the, here's the truth of all this. We, we can choose to pitch our tents in a lot of different places. Like, like we can put our tents up in, in the land of fear. We can put our tents up in the land of guilt, the land of anxiety. We, we can pitch a tent in the land of negativity. Just got to be careful with that one because it's pretty crowded. Like, like you could, you could pitch, your, pitch your tent in the land of bitterness 
or we can pitch our tent in the land of hope. And so for the next four weeks, that's what we're going to do. We're, we're, we're going to settle in the land of hope. And, and we're going to believe that God is going to meet us there in a special way. You know, the Christmas uh, season for me as, as a pastor, as I prepare messages, is really kind of difficult. Um, because I, my, my goal in, in my, my prayer is, through all this is that God would give me just a fresh revelation of who he is so I can, uh, you know, bring it and through his work of the Holy Spirit in me. You know, we can have it on Sunday morning. And so, uh, because it, it, it is difficult uh, because preaching the Christmas messages, um, there's not a lot of different directions you can go. Um, you know, it is what it is. Like Christ came, he was born, he was a baby, you know, sweet little seven pound, six ounce baby Jesus, you know, and, and, and like, like Easter, like same thing every year, but, but it's like, man, it, you can come at it from different directions. There's so many different things that are happening in that moment. Like Christmas is, is Christmas. And, and so it's, 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 it's a little difficult to come with something fresh and new. And so my prayer over the season of Advent and the season of expectation, the season of hope that we will see Christ in a new way. Y'all believe that? Y'all believe that we can see Christ in a new way and remember through this time that we're pitching our tents in this land of hope. So Matthew 1, we're going to look at the story, the birth of Jesus and how it was foretold by Matthew. And so we're going to be in Matthew 1 and we're going to start in verse 18. And it says this, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to your home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on and says, you'll give birth to a son and you'll give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Man, that is good news right there. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so I want to, I want to kind of tell us uh, what our thrill of hope is during this season. The first one is found right there. The thrill of hope is that God is with us. That's what that word Emmanuel means, that God is with us. His presence is with us. Um, have you ever been somewhere where all of a sudden you're kind of standing around, you're in public, and there's this, this frenzy starts to take place? Like people are kind of rushing over to this area, and you're like, you start asking, like, what's going on? Like, and you find out like there's a, there's a famous person there. And so like, you're like, well, I don't really know that I would want to go run to Justin Bieber, but, but you know, like, like, so you find out and all these, like, like people are kind of in a frenzy. I remember a, a few years back, the Braves, the Atlanta Braves, our baseball team just in Atlanta, um, where they would go around to like Academy sports and they bring a few players there and you could get in line and you could get autographs from them. Well, we found out that one day that Freddie Freeman was going to be at the one in Athens. And so uh, my son, my oldest son, his favorite player has been Freddie Freeman since he knew what baseball was. And so, um, and so, so he, we, we make plans to go down to Athens to Academy Sports. And we go there and we get there and there's a line out the door. And we're like, uh, no way, I'm standing in that line. Um, and so come to find out, we didn't have to worry about standing in line because we weren't there in time to get a ticket to actually get to stand in line. And so what do we do? We, we go up to the front and we kind of stand behind like the guardrail and we're like fanboys just watching Freddie Freeman sign his name over and over and over. Like, like, and so like, but it take, it took me back to like when I was his age and like, that would have been like Dale Murphy for me. If y'all remember back in the eighties, Dale Murphy for the Braves, like, like that would have been me and Dale Murphy because there's something special and there, there's something about being in the presence of someone who is great at what they do. There's just something about that. I had, uh, I've had the opportunity over my lifetime to meet people who are great at what they do and, and who are famous for it, you know, uh, athletes and actors and actresses and musicians. And, and now I like, 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 uh, like get all giddy about meeting like pastors that I admire. And I'm like, Ooh, we can't we go and like, like I'm going to talk to them and figure out what he does to, you know, do this. And so all this, so, but, uh, but it's completely different. Like it's a 
completely different ball game when that person who's somebody knows who you are. Like when they know who you are, it's completely different. I remember a couple years ago, we were in Washington, D.C., and, um, and we decided we'd go to a baseball game at the Nationals, the Washington Nationals. I'm, I'm a baseball fan, in case you don't know, didn't know that. And so we, um, we went to the game, and I had texted a buddy of mine who works for the Nationals as one of their TV personalities. Well, it just so happens that he used to be a former Major League Baseball player. He was an all-star. He was a World Series MVP. Uh, and, and so, and, and so we, we get there. I text him. I tell him we're coming. And so we get to where he's doing his little TV show at the end of the game. And we're standing there. And as the security guards are coming along and says, you know, gates are closed. Y'all got to get out. He motions to the security guard and says, no, 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 no. They're with me. You see, that makes me feel really important. Okay. Like, I, like this little dude, like I'm not important, but it makes me feel important because I'm like, yeah, yeah, y'all got to get out. Go on. Y'all go, get on out of here. I'm going to stay up in here and, you know, um, you know? like, 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 because it's a completely different ball game when, when that person knows who you are. You know, we could all probably think about times we bumped into somebody who's known for, for what they do. They're, they're, they're famous, so they've got a little bit of recognizable, not recognizability. And so, uh, like, but, but, but it's just like, it's, there's just something like being in the presence of somebody who's great at what they do. Here's the deal. All the instances that we've bumped in or we know somebody that, that, that's great at what they do, or, uh, when we talk about that and we, and we juxtapose that with, with, with being in the presence of the Almighty God, shouldn't we get a little bit excited about that? Shouldn't we be like, wow, I get to be in the presence of God. And he knows me. Like, he knows who I am. He knows my name. You get to be like, wow, I just bumped into the presence of God. That's what Christmas celebrates. That's the thrill of hope that we have. God of the universe, the creator of the universe, the sovereign one, became one of us. He became like me. He became like you. He moved into the neighborhood. It's what we call, the the big theological word for that is the incarnation. And what I love about Jesus, and when you read the Gospels, he's the epitome of holiness, but he was never holier than thou. He was right there. He was tangible. He was touchable. Like That's why you couldn't keep the prostitutes and the sinners and you couldn't keep the lepers and you couldn't keep the little children and you couldn't even keep the Pharisees who didn't like him. You couldn't keep him away from him because he was so just relatable and he was right there. He was right there with us. He was God with us. He was right there. The sovereign God of the universe, the God most high became the God most nigh. He was close. He was near to us. And so I want to just... Just, just dive in, just camp out here and let's, let's wrap our, our minds around how big this is. Because think about this, in Isaiah 55, 8, uh, so some theological groundwork for this. As, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, declares the Lord. That's, that's, that's in Isaiah, okay? That's the prophet Isaiah saying, d- d- comparing the, our thoughts and God's thoughts with the separation of the universe, Okay? Let's grasp how big the universe is for a second. Just just for a second, okay? Uh, Put this in perspective. Light travels, okay? The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, okay? That's really fast, all right? Uh, Just real quick, if, if you can snap, just snap, really. One, two, three. Just that quick. Y'all know how many times light circumnavigated the globe? Half dozen, another half dozen, another. Like, is, th- th- think about how fast that is. The sun, the, the center of our universe, the sun is 93 million miles away from earth, okay? If we were to drive to the sun, like get in our car, drive to the sun, and we're gonna, we're gonna set our cruise control at 65 miles an hour, which is really slow in my opinion, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, I know we got a police officer, y'all don't judge me, okay? But, but look, 65 miles an hour. And if we drove 24 hours straight, 365 days, anybody wanna guess how long it would take us to get to the sun? 
Yeah, I wouldn't want to guess either. It's 163 years to drive to the sun. That's how far the sun is away from us. And it took eight minutes for the light from the sun to get to us today. And that's the closest star that we have in our, in our galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy. It's the closest star. They have discovered galaxies 15 billion light years away from us. I can't even think how far that is. I just explained how far the sun is from us. Think about 15 billion. Think like, like it's uncomprehendable. I don't even know if that's a word. Like it's so big and it's so, and that's, that's the distance between my thoughts and God's thoughts. J- Jeremiah says that we cannot fathom his greatness. There's a, a popular song, um, it's still popular today, it's been out for years, it's called How Great Is Our God. And, and the writer of that song, Chris Tomlin, he talked about one time, he said, he said, you know, we were sitting there thinking like, what's another word that we could write that, that's, that's better than the word great? And like, as we're sitting there, it's like, there's not one. There's not, a better, there's not a better word we can describe God than great. Paul in Ephesians 3 says that God can do immeasurably more than we can even ask, imagine, or think. He's God most high, but he came down and became God most nigh. He came near to us. He came close to us. Go back to Genesis. We'll go back to Genesis 1. We'll come back to Bethlehem in just a minute, okay? In, in, in Genesis 1, there's, it says the Spirit of God was hovering Okay? He was hovering over the waters. That word hovering, if you look it up, you study it in the Hebrew, it's kind of like a two-dimensional word. All right? it's a two, and so you've got like time and space, the two dimensions, right? You've got time and space. Y'all, y'all, know, y'all follow me, right? So you've got time and you've got space. So if you, it, it, what, it, what it's talking about here when it says God is hovering, so he's, it, when you talk about time, it's like he's there the split second before and he's there the split second after. So it's kind of like these parentheses of time that God is around us. Thomas uh, Merton captured it this way. He says, the Lord travels in all directions at once. The Lord arrives in all directions at once. Wherever we are, we find that he just departed. Wherever we go, we find that he just arrived before us. It's an idea that he is alpha and he is omega, the beginning and the end. You see, God exists outside of our time and our space dimension. That's the idea of him just hovering. The second dimension of the idea of this is the space idea, that he's just right in front of us and he's just right in back of us, right behind us. It's a parenthesis of of space. God has us surrounded. He's all around us all the time. He is with us. He is with you. David put it this way. Basically the same thing I said, so I'll support it with some scripture here. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. A.W. Tozer says it like this. God is above, but he's not pushed up. He's beneath, but he's not pressed down. He's outside, but he's not excluded. He's inside, but he's not confined. God is above all things, presiding beneath all things, sustaining outside all things, embracing and inside all things, filling he what he says, this is the eminence of God. This is the, who God is. He is God with us. God most high became God most nigh. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. He moved into the neighborhood. He put skin on. Hebrews 4, 15 says, says we don't have a, a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who's tempted in every way. Just as we are, yet he was without sin. This is so amazing. We have a high priest who's so relatable. He's touchable. He's tangible. He's accessible. I think a lot of times we take all that for granted. Look, the Jews, before Jesus died, the Jews couldn't do this. Like this was not part of their, 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 their ability to do it. It would have broken the law. Like only one person could go into the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. There's only one person that could uh, go in and atone for their sins. He said, we don't have that. We have immediate access because God is with us. He invites us into his throne room. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy 
and find grace to help us in our time of need. One of the other songs we might hear uh, during this season is called O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And basically, if you look at that, remember we said the word Emmanuel is God, it means God with us. So it's O Come, O Come, God with us. And so what he's saying in that, what we're singing, what God is singing to us is, O Come, O Come, Mickey. O come, O come, Mickey, come to me, Mickey. He's singing that. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone says, uh, Come in, I will sup with him, and he with me. It's the idea that at Bethlehem, when Jesus was born, he stepped out of heaven. He became one of us. He became like you and me, and he invited us to this table. He invited us into this relationship. He said, hey, I'm with you. I'm God with you. But he's not just God with us. He's God for us. He's God for us. There's a, um, an old wives' tale, I guess you could say, but it's a story of, of uh, a kid named Benjamin at Christmas, and he wanted a baby sister for Christmas. And uh, so, he, so he started to pray, and he started to, to write his prayer out, and he says, Dear God, I've, I've been a very good boy this year. And he gets to that last thing, and he goes, mm, I, I, I can't fool God. I, I got to start. So he, he crumbles it up, throws it away, and, and then he says, Okay, dear God, I, I've, I've, I've been a pretty good boy. And then he stops again, and he says, I just don't feel like that's very convincing. I don't feel like that's really going to help. So he throws it away, and then he came up with a little plan. And he, goes to the, he goes to the bathroom, and he gets this towel. Okay? And then he goes over to the nativity scene, and he takes Mary, and he wraps her up in this towel, and he puts it under, under, his, under his mattress. He says, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, <laughs> you know, we laugh at that. Because it's, I mean, it's kind of funny, right? But I think it's kind of sad because it's kind of what we do. You know, it's kind of what we do. God, if you'll do this, I'll, I'll do this. You know, you know what that is? It's called a bribe. Well, well God, if, if, you won't, if, if you won't do this, then I won't do this. You, y'all know what that is, right? That's called blackmail. But, but that's how we pray. That's what, that's what we do. And see, here's the thing. That's never going to work. And here's the, here's the good news of that. We don't have to do that. We don't even have to do that. God doesn't withhold good from his own children. When we start to understand the heart of our Father, we start to understand that he loves us. I love this verse in Matthew 11, and I've used it regularly, and I love just just the idea behind it, what it says. It says, if you then, though, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Man, what, isn't that good news? If we as people, me as a dad, if I know how to give really good gifts to my kids, sometimes they may disagree that they're good gifts. Okay, that's fair. They can do that, but they're not the ones giving them. But if I know how to, like, if I'm sitting there and I'm giving gifts to my kids and good gifts, and, and I'm, and, and, and like all, but, and I'm evil, like I'm a human, I'm broken. How much more does a perfect heavenly father know how to give good gifts to his kids? God loves us so much more than we can imagine. And he's for us. He's for us. He's with us. He's for us. And finally, maybe the best news we can have, God is in us. He is God in us. Uh, John 16, uh, verse 7, Jesus kind of said something that would have been a little controversial and probably really confusing to the audience that he was saying it to. He said this is very truly, uh, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, let me explain why this might would have caused some controversy. Because this is the same guy who stood up and he says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of, t- end of the age. Like the same words. And then he gets up and he says, ah, bye, y'all. He probably said that, y'all. You know, he's like, like I'm leaving. I got to go. 
Can you imagine the confusion? They're sitting there, whoa, stop, stop. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, first off, where are you going? And why, you know, you remember the disciples, like, can, can we come with you? Like, like, why are you leaving? You told us you wouldn't. Well, let me explain to why he said this. You see, Jesus was a man, just like you and just like me, human. He had skin on. And so just like you and just like me, he could not be everywhere at the same time. He was bound by the laws of physics, the laws of gravity. He was bound by all that. And so he had to leave. So he wouldn't be bound by that. And that's what he says. He's, I'm sending you an advocate. And there, there's, there's another verse that says, and, and he's going to be better than, than I am. You see, the only way that Jesus was going to be able to be God in us is that if he ascended back to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit to be within of us. He, within us, he had to go away. And that was the only way he could dwell in us. That's why we've been saying Jesus inside you is always better than Jesus beside you. There's a song that, um, that we've sang periodically, and we don't sing it too much. Um, it's called Holy Spirit. You probably would recognize the tune. It's been on the radio. Um, it's, the, the kind of tagline of that song says, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come fill this place and flood the atmosphere. Um, and so I, I think we kind of get a, a, a misconception of, of what that song really truly means. Like I've heard it explained before, like uh, some, some uh, people that don't like the song, you know, they're saying, well, what are we doing? Just waiting for the Holy Spirit, like out in the hallway. And then we sing that song, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. He's like, okay, the door's open. He can come on in. Like, like, come on. Like we, we all know that's not true, but, but here's the thing about that song. And what I believe that song is, is remind, at least what it reminds me uh, is first Corinthians six, where it says the temple of the Holy Spirit is me. Okay. That it's not reminding me that the Holy Spirit is welcome in this room. It's reminding me that the Holy Spirit needs to be welcome in my life. That I need to, to, to take myself out of the way sometimes and allow the Holy Spirit to do in my life what he wants to do because he's in here. He's God in me. And I think we, we kind of take this and we talk about, you know, just we're coming to church. No, we are the church. And that's why, that's why we celebrate Christmas. He's God with us. He's God for us and he's God in us. Let me close uh, this morning as we uh, step into the, the Christmas season. Um, I think it's, it's um, in a sense, um, that we, you know, I think a lot of times we take for granted what, what all God has blessed us with, uh, in, in a sense. Um, you know, and, and especially during this season, because I think it gets so busy a lot of times. Uh, the, you know, the busyness of shopping and the busyness of parties and travel and if you're able to travel and anything else you may or may not be able to do. And um, I think we, we, we got to kind of take a step back sometimes and, and remember what this thing's all about. You know, like, like Charlie Brown. You know, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. That our hearts are filled with gratitude. This thrill of hope that God stepped out of him. He became God with us and that he's God for us. And that he's God in us. You know, this week... Um, like probably most of y'all in here, I celebrated Thanksgiving on Thursday uh, with, a, with turkey and dressing and all that good stuff. But it looked a little different this year for us. Uh, normally, we're able to go to our extended family over uh, to the state that's left of us. Um, I don't want to mention uh, what state that is. I'm a Georgia boy, okay? But, uh, but, uh, but we usually go to Alabama uh, and see my extended family and get to see my grandfather who's... Eh, uh, who's uh, about to be 94 years old in a couple months, and for obvious reasons, we, we chose this year not to, um, not to be around a lot of people. And so, um, so it looked a little different, you know, it, it, it looked, uh, you know, and so we got there, and I'm at my parents' house down in South Georgia, and, um, you know, we talked about it, and, and we talked about some of the memories and some of the things that, you know, we've been doing for years at Thanksgiving that, that we didn't get to do this year. You know, because the thing about it was, was there was people missing. And at some point in our life, we're going to come across a holiday where there's more people missing. It's just the way, it's just, look, it's, the statistics are still out that one in one 
are going are gonna to die. And we're all going to face that at some point, that there's going to be a season or a birthday that comes around uh, where, where there's someone that was there that's, that's not there, and their presence is no longer with us. And uh, we're, we, as a family, I have four kids, and my wife and I, we're probably in the busiest uh, season of our life with them. Um, they all, three of them play sports, um, and they're all playing different sports, and they're all torn in different directions. And we, we, you know, we got to carry them here, we got to get them there, we got to go here, we got to show up at their ball game here, we got to leave that ball game and go to a practice over here, and, and then we got to do this. And then we just, we have a two, almost three year old, um, and he's just a two, almost three year old. And so you can you, you can imagine how how much work he is. And so uh, and so we're probably in the busiest season of our life. And the gift that we get during this season is, is our presence. Not, not presence, like the going to the tree, our presence, being together, being around. You know, if I could say one thing about my parents when I was growing up is that's what they were. They were present. They were there. You know, I had a game, I had a whatever. I didn't have any recitals or anything like that because um, I was too busy playing the games. But, but, uh, but they would have been there no matter what it was. They would have been there. Their presence is what matters, and that's the gift. The thrill that we get to celebrate at, at this time of year is the presence of each other. It doesn't matter what's under the tree, right? Really? I mean, yeah, they're nice to have. It's nice to get presents under the tree. But it's the presence of people is, that, is what we come to appreciate and that's what we celebrate. It's the presence of the Holy One that came to us. The greatest gift ever imaginable. The thrill of hope found only in the Son. John 3.16, God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. You see, here's the thing about those verses. What God is saying is that I, I don't, I love you so much that I, I don't want to just be with you. I just don't want to be just God with you and God for you and God in you. So I want to be that for eternity. I want to be that forever. So in this season as we celebrate, as we get to look at what the thrill of hope really means, what it truly means in our life, don't miss these opportunities. Have Jesus right here with us, in his presence. Father, this morning I thank you. I thank you that you've given us your son. I thank you that we can worship and come. We can come to you. Father, in these moments, I thank you that we can be in your presence. We can get excited about being here in your presence, in your midst. And there's nowhere we can go to escape it. So, Father, Father, we ask during this season that you'll stir in us this thrill of hope for your son. This morning, if you're here, and you would say you've never accepted the gift that God has given us through his son. The gift that God has given us through his presence. That you've never accepted the gift of God with us, God for us, and God in us. That today would be that day that you accept that gift. The best gift you could ever get 
at this time of year. There's nothing under the tree that could ever be better than the gift of Jesus. So if that's you and you've never accepted that gift, I I just want to ask you this morning, because you know if you have or not, I want to ask you this morning a simple question. Will you accept God's gift? Will you accept God's gift? gift the answer to the question if if it's yes it's simple explain to you how you accept it you just say yes it's that simple yes i accept the gift god be my savior come and live in me come be god in me Father, cleanse us. Father, continue to move us towards you. Jesus, I thank you in your name. Amen.